Hey, Pretty Girl Club. Welcome back to the Dark Femininity series. If you guys are really loving this series. Be sure to check out my Dark Femininity course. I also have a members page on this YouTube channel as well as a Patreon. All three of them are different. Um, but I want to talk about dark femininity and using it to attract things like fame, popularity, and visibility. So a lot of people talk about the whole pretty privilege thing and how like they don't have pretty privilege and you know it sucks not being considered pretty but what I believe about pretty privilege is number one there are many different types of pretty privilege I also believe that beauty is fluid and that beauty is subjective so think about all the different body types that people consider beautiful think about all the different phenotypes and hair colors that can be considered beautiful I actually believe that the true thing that causes you to be perceived as beautiful is really visibility um, beauty is a form of social power but I also believe that if you have social power and visibility you're more likely to be seen as beautiful this is why some people who have no visibility they complain and they say well this person is worshipped for their beauty and they're not prettier than me they're just more visible than me and they're actually correct because beauty is so subjective to the point where you have no, um, there is no universal standard of beauty. Some people are going to try to argue and say, oh no, having straight white teeth and clear skin are like a universal standard of beauty. And again, that's not necessarily true. Some cultures like tattoos, so that's technically not clear skin. Um, some cultures do not care about having straight white teeth. So beauty is so subjective to the point where if you want to be seen as more beautiful, something that can help your perceived beauty is by attaining things like fame, popularity, and visibility. This is also another reason why some women fight so hard and get so mad when they are not represented in the media because they feel like that uh, that social status and that pretty privilege and that halo effect does not trickle down to them. Think about why some people consider blondes to be beautiful. Well, it has to do with things like visibility. It has to do with things like how they're portrayed in the media, kind of how they're sexualized in the media, really. Um, but visibility greatly affects your perceived beauty. And this is called the status halo. So I first encountered the status halo when I was in high school. Um, I don't know if you guys had like a popular girl in high school where out in the real world, she may not have been considered the prettiest, but because she had a high social status and she was popular, she got asked to prom, she got told that she was very pretty, she got treated like how a pretty girl would be treated. And so when I was a teenager, that was the first time I learned about how status actually affects your perceived attractiveness. Another way that the status halo effect can work is when it comes to men actually. So let's say a guy is short and fat and bald, but he is a multi-billionaire. Suddenly girls will start saying, oh, he's attractive. Oh, he's cute. Oh, look at, ha look at his eye color. So they will ignore the other things that may be associated with not being attractive about him, such as being short, fat, and bald. They may ignore those things and just pick and choose whatever features they do find to be attractive and different. Or some women will say, I like short guys, or I like bald guys, or I like fat guys. And maybe they never liked that before, but because of the status that is associated with him and with his billions, suddenly he is also living the same lifestyle as a everyday handsome man who is maybe not as rich. And this is why a lot of people, like I said, they get upset because they feel like, beauty standards are not real. And I, I agree with that. Beauty standards have more to do with like psychology and brainwashing and visibility and um, marketing and stuff like that. So if you're one of those people who wants to change the beauty standard and you want the beauty standard to favor yourself more, I say this all the time, represent yourself, show yourself, put yourself on social media or, you know, do your best to like become a model if you can. And if you can't, then you can create your own fashion line and model your own clothing. This is a strategy that people have used for decades. They have utilized their own fame, success, and visibility to be perceived as more beautiful. This is also why people get pissed at my channel marketing because not only do I call us the pretty girl club in every single video, but I also am to the point where I have shown actual pictures of actual subscribers and I consistently represent all of our phenotypes here on this channel. And so from here on out, 
anytime you hear the term exotical on another channel, you're automatically associating it with beauty. And this is because I understand the psychology of beauty, I understand subliminal messaging, and I also understand marketing. So beauty is really about things like visibility and subliminal messaging. But when I use the term visibility, I'm not just talking about media visibility because there are plenty of groups of women who are not very visible in American media who still have pretty privilege every day. Think about fat women who are living with pretty privilege every day. Think about, um, I'm thinking of Asian women, I'm thinking of like Indian women. These types of women are not seen in American media very much. I don't see a lot of superhero movies starring Asian women and Asian men or East Indian women and East Indian men, but because they know how to make themselves visible in their personal life and on their social media accounts or, you know, just in their own social circle, they still can attain pretty privilege. And I think that one of the mistakes that women make in social climbing is, once again, they're relying on others to represent them and they are not giving their power back to themselves. They're giving all of their power to Hollywood and then they just spend all day complaining about Hollywood instead of spending all day actually beautifying themselves and curating their own internal beauty standard. Think about Asian women, for example. Um, a lot of them are not shown very much in um, American media, but a lot of Asian women are fantastic at cultivating their own unique internal beauty standards. A lot of the natural home remedies um, that I have watched online have come from Asian women. Also think about things like K-pop or kawaii fashion or like um, kind of that cosplay scene or um, even like the Harajuku girls back in like the early 2000s. A lot of women in the Asian community decided to create their own internal beauty standard for themselves to the point where so many women were doing it and look so beautiful doing it, to the point where it ended up in the media. And so I think that one of the mistakes that women make when it comes to building their collective pretty privilege is they rely only on the media. And that's not how media works. I used to work in media. Media follows the trends of the people. And so if they see a certain group of women that that group of women doesn't care about themselves, they don't take care of themselves, they don't beautify themselves within their natural phenotypes or whatever, um, they're constantly pedestalizing or worshiping other phenotypes, then the media is not even going to pick up on the trend to begin with. And so, by the way, you get to decide what type of beauty is the most valuable to you. Is it If it's beauty in the media, then you should be working in the media. You should be building your own production company. By the way, that's exactly what I'm doing. I didn't wait for my exact phenotype to be in the media. I mean, my personal face is not necessarily in the media. There are women who look like me, but not me myself. And so I decided to start my own YouTube channel because remember, social media is still a form of media. I decided to start my own channel and a community to where other women who look like me where we can speak for ourselves, number one, so people can't put words in our mouths. They can't accuse us of all these different isms. That's number one. Number two, I am promoting my own phenotype. Um, the way that I carry myself here on YouTube, I understand that people are going to stereotype me. So the way that I carry my personality here in this media space called YouTube, that's also very important. So it's important for me to like carry myself with class and be uplifting. This is also why you're never going to see me beefing with other women in the exotical space. You're not going to see it. You're not going to see me bashing content creators who look like me or pulling up pictures of women with my features talking about how ugly those things are because that's harming my collective image, whether those women, whether I like those women or not, it's harming my collective image. So that's another important thing to remember when it comes to using dark femininity to increase not just your visibility, but the collective image of other women within your group. I definitely believe that fame makes people appear more attractive because even if you look at the way that people describe celebrities, they'll be like, oh, so-and-so is wearing this beautiful dress to the Met Gala. Meanwhile, the dress she's wearing is, is not beautiful. It looks really crazy. But people will automatically associate beauty with other qualities such as fame or class or being at the Met Gala, having the prestige and the wealth and the popularity to be invited to the Met Gala. So that's just an, an example. That's just kind of my theory as well. Um, Another thing that people have to realize is that anytime you have some sort of fame, you are risking the invasion of your privacy. Like people might end up stalking you or they might 
end up like being extra mean to you because people put fame on such a high pedestal to the point where they will treat you like you're not even a human anymore. For those of you who saw my uh, previous video about Ari Fletcher, you guys saw how they were treating her. You guys saw how badly they were talking about her and how they were dragging the way that she looks. That is something that happens when people are considered to be famous. Anyone who is considered high status is automatically going to be attacked by those of lower status. Notice how oftentimes it's poor people who are talking shit about rich people. Usually it's the women without pretty privilege who talk shit about women who do have pretty privilege. So for the most part, people who do not have that privilege, they're going to talk shit about those who do. But what people don't realize is that those same people would gladly trade lives with those privileged people if they could. So this is why on my channel, you don't tend to hear me talking a bunch of shit about privileges because I understand that I am manifesting more privilege as time goes on because I'm getting paid, you know, my income's going up. So I'm technically going to join those privileged people, or at least my goal is to join privileged people when it comes to wealth. My goal is to join privileged people when it comes to having a high status or a high subscriber count. And so by talking shit about it, that causes cognitive dissonance. And if, if you're trying to manifest something, I feel like I'm being so spiritual today. I'm not even spiritual, but I feel like some things are better explained using spiritual terms. But if you're trying to manifest something in your life, yet you're speaking against it, that's a form of cognitive dissonance. And so it's going to harm your mental clarity. And I need all of my mental clarity and my creativity so that I can get closer to my goal of attaining fame and popularity on YouTube. Another thing that I've learned since uh, kind of putting my work here on YouTube, one thing that I've learned is that as your popularity increases, it's very important to stay true to who you are and stay true to why you're doing what you're doing in the first place because people will try to sway you or they may try to kind of get you off track or they will beg you to represent them. Like a lot of people push their agendas on famous people. They'll be like, you need to speak, you need to speak about this cause. You need to help that charity. You need to help this ethnicity. And it's like, if you as the person in the position of popularity, if you allow every single person to sway you, you're gonna come off as a flip flopper. I see politicians making that mistake all the time where they're coming off as flip floppers because they think that by switching sides or kind of switching opinions that is going to increase their popularity, but it actually decreases your popularity. Something that has helped this channel to attain a small amount of fame so far is the polarity. The polarity of this channel and my polarizing opinions help me to attract, number one, my core audience, and then it also helps me to repel the types of people I don't want on my channel. I don't want people on this channel who have a victim mentality. I don't want women on this channel who think that they are ugly and who have no desire to grow in terms of their own beauty. I don't want certain groups of women on this channel. And so being more polarizing actually has helped me to succeed on here because now I have been able to almost have kind of like this siren call for other people who think like me. So that's one of the ways that you can actually grow your fame and visibility. It's by being polarizing. And this is how a lot of women mess themselves up. Like, let's say you want your beauty to be famous, like your phenotype. The way you would mess yourself up with that is by trying to look like another phenotype because you're actually popularizing that phenotype as opposed to whatever yours is. So it's very, it's very important to be as authentic as possible and as like polarizing as possible. And this is only for if you're trying to attract fame and popularity. Another thing that you can learn how to do if you are on a journey of manifesting fame and visibility is learning how to separate the fame from your personal identity. So for example, there's always going to be someone who's more famous than you or more visible than you or someone who's coming up and like they might surpass you or something. And so as long as you have other pieces of your identity that you can fall back on, you'll be okay. But I've noticed that the women who uh, they center their whole entire identity around their fame, they tend to be the ones who get threatened when somebody else is coming up and they are kind of approaching that same level of fame. One thing that I've learned is to focus on my craft or focus on, you know, whatever it is that is making me famous, like if it's a natural talent, if it's a book I'm writing, you know, just focusing on the art because I consider myself to be a creative artist by being a, a content creator. I mean, that's really what that means. 
Um, so I try to focus on my creation process rather than focusing on how many subscribers do I have? How many people are making videos about me? How many people are talking about me? Oh no, I feel sad now because other content creators aren't talking about me anymore. No, I've learned how to um, separate the fame itself from my identity. I just view fame as more of a side effect. I view the visibility of this YouTube channel as a side effect to my content creation process. One of the core pieces of my identity, actually, is that I am a creator. That's that's one of my um, affirmations that I've been saying since I was like a little kid. And I truly do believe that I am a, a creator, like a content creator. And when I say content, I'm not just talking about YouTube. I'm talking about this could be anything. It could be books. It could be photos. It could be thumbnails or banners. So I try to identify more with that because that's not something that can be taken away from me. My creative abilities can't be taken away because me being creative, that comes from within. Um, but the thing about fame is that it does partially rely on other people, like popularity and stuff. It partially relies on other people. So if the trends change and let's say those trends don't resonate with you and you don't want to um, go with those trends or speak on those trends, your fame can go down, like your fame can go up and down. So I, I actually don't believe fame is some sort of skill that like, oh, you know, you, you got the key to becoming famous. No, I really believe that fame is more of a side effect of having other skills, such as uh, being good at marketing, or you're really good at your natural talents, you're really consistent, you're very disciplined, you're good at managing a business, you know how to grow your business and get more revenue, and then you invest that money into other ventures, and then people start noticing it more. So that's kind of how I view fame. Another thing that a lot of people won't admit is that everyone is fighting for their own slice of fame. Think about this. Why do you want to have a big birthday party? Well, it's so you can feel famous for that day. It's so you can be notable and popular for that day. So people can talk about you that day because it's your special day. You want to be treated special on your birthday. You want people to notice you on your birthday. Why do people want weddings and stuff? Big weddings, engagement parties, house warmings. Those are all very, very small slices of fame. And so for those who look down on fame, you should probably stop doing that because you don't realize that you are actually, you're still seeking after fame in one way or another. So whether you want it to be known that it's your birthday or your wedding day, or it's your son or daughter's birthday, those are all still like very, very tiny slices of fame. But I want to pull up this chart. It has light versus dark feminine traits. And so notice how on the top part it says, passionate, like being passionate is one of the traits of dark femininity. And so obviously being passionate is going to help you to be more likely to have visibility because if you're the one who is creating the most content, you're the one who's showing up the most, you're going to eventually become more successful at that. You're going to, at the very least, you will gain new skills and that will give you an edge over others. One of the edges that I have on this YouTube channel is that I simply create more content than other people. So when other content creators are not showing up on this platform, I'm always here every single day. Well, for the most part, I try to upload almost every day that I can. I have been so passionate about this channel to where when I'm on my vacation, like when I was in Mexico with my family, I actually felt inspired to create content because I actually have a passion for talking about these things and building a community with like-minded women. And so that passion works in my favor because it causes me to have this insane work ethic because it doesn't feel like work to me because I actually have a passion for what I'm doing here on YouTube. I did not believe that this was a real thing. Um, just one year ago, I didn't even believe in the concept of a dream job because I would be like, oh, I don't dream of labor. But technically, YouTube is my job, so it, it is technically labor, but it doesn't feel like labor because I'm talking about dark femininity. Like, how is that labor? To someone else, it might be labor, though, because it's not their passion. And so one of the dark feminine traits you can use is by 
trying to stay within your passions. So that's going to be very important, like finding what you're passionate about. Is it fashion? Is it doing makeup? Is it working with animals? It doesn't have to be content creation or being a celebrity. It could just be something else. Is it writing? Do you really do you really like short stories or something? Because when you are working from a place of passion, you're going to have way more longevity because your motive is not fame. Your motive is to do your passion, which is for me, it's creating content. This is my passion. I love talking my shit. I like talking about things that are controversial and that that's my passion. So what I've tried to do is find a way to stay within my passions as much as possible and to eliminate the other stuff that I'm not passionate about. And that has helped me to attain more visibility because it increased my work ethic. I was willing to show up more because I loved what I was doing. It reminds me of those people who really love singing and they really love learning vocal technique. Um, Beyonce is one of the people I'm thinking of. She loves to learn accurate vocal technique. And so she also loves to dance and stuff like that. And so that's why people say, oh, she has like, a, uh, like this crazy work ethic. Well, she's obviously operating from a place of passion. Clearly she doesn't mind dancing for 16 hours and singing all the time because she's been doing it for decades at this point. A lot of people who go into music, they just sing their song, you know, they have their one hit, they're a one hit wonder, and then they just take their money and go. But if you're passionate about something, you're more likely to have longevity. And the more longevity you have, the more likely you are to figure out strategies on how to succeed. And that's because you're simply more interested in what you're doing versus other people. So like for me, I, I like to experiment with my channel. I like to experiment with different pilot series on this channel. I like to talk about different topics and a lot of other content creators, they're not doing that. They are just sticking to one washed up talking point from like 2015 and they haven't changed it in a long time because Maybe they felt like, oh, that's what gave me the popularity, so let me keep doing that. But that's how you experience burnout. The burnout comes from doing a bunch of things you're not passionate about, uh, maybe operating from a place of competition rather than enjoying what you're doing. Because when I think about a passion, I think about doing something that I enjoy. And another thing that I've learned is that passion will give you longevity and skill will help you to kind of elevate. So for example, I have editing skills, but editing is not my passion. And so at some point, I'm going to probably outsource my editing or, you know, that's why I do like kind of less editing on here because I want to spend more time speaking and talking and researching for these videos and kind of like studying and pulling screenshots and stuff. That is more so my passionate side. And also another thing that I've learned that has helped me to manifest more visibility and popularity, not just on YouTube, but just in life, it is to try to blend as many passions together as possible. So for you, let's say you're good at exercising and you're also good at photography can you take photos like instagram photos of yourself exercising and become a fitness influencer because a lot of people they think that fame only requires one one or two skills or you know to to have all this visibility it only requires that you look a certain way or oh just be white and then you'll be famous no that that's false like you have to have some sort of skills you have to show up on set so you can be in the movie, you have to memorize some lines, you have to interact with makeup artists and people who are, you know, trying to put your costume together and stuff. So this whole narrative that like, if you have fame, it's all just 100% purely by chance. I, I don't think that everything in this life is just 100% purely by chance. I think that you can do certain things to set yourself up to have more visibility. And those are things like operating in your passions because that's gonna help you to have longevity. Oh, and that's another thing that I learned too when it came to kind of manifesting visibility and fame. It's not putting a timeline on it because I've noticed that some, some women get discouraged because they feel like I want popularity and I want it now. And it's like, that's not how life works. But I feel like we live in this instant gratification society where people think you can just have this microwave fame and I know that because of social media, a lot of people think, oh, this person blew up overnight. But no, usually they had that TikTok account for like maybe a little while, or maybe they started off on TikTok and they were posting more and more TikToks every single day. And then it helped them to become more visible over time. Another way that you can kind of work towards manifesting fame is 
if you look on this, the dark feminine traits, um, it talks about being seductive. So I, I want to talk about that really quick because a lot of people associate being seductive with just like sex, but being seductive just means you're kind of like, you're, you're being persuasive in a way. Seduction can be used in sales. Um, maybe you are coming off as very professional and it makes people want to buy from you. Another area where I think of seduction is actually in friendships. If you're a very personable type of person, if you're very like easygoing and you're very good at creating friendships, you can actually create friendships with people who are more successful than you or people who um, can pull you into their circles. You can kind of network with people. So in terms of YouTube, um, one of the ways that I use seduction is not only with my editing style, because that's that's one of the ways of doing it. That's kind of my signature editing style. <laughs> well, it became my signature editing style because I refused to do anything higher quality than that. Um, but it became my signature. But one of the seductive tactics that I use is I like to make friends. And by the way, um, the definition of seductive is attractive or tempting, alluring, and enticing. So when I think of terms like attractive and enticing, I'm actually thinking of my personality. I really do feel like I am a girl's girl and I have a good friendship personality. I'm very um, friendly with other girls on YouTube and stuff. So that is technically a form of seduction. Like you can befriend people who are also on their own level up journey. So I, I actually did this I did this when it came to exercising because I wanted to increase my visibility in terms of um, having pretty privilege. Like I wanted my body to be more visible. So I started making friends with girls who were more in shape than me and I started learning from them. So like one of my friends, I talk about her on the Patreon. She does like Pilates. She's a fitness influencer. Um, I have a couple of friends who do fitness influencing and stuff and hanging out with them and basically having a, an attractive friendship personality. You know how I talk about friendship types? I don't think I've talked about it on my public YouTube, but I definitely have talked about it on Patreon. Um, but if you remember me talking about friendship types, I believe that um, women have different types of friends that they are compatible with. So it's similar to how you would think of dating, except you just take out the sexual part. It's just like my type of friend that I want is a girl who is leveled up. Um, it's even better actually, if she has something that's more leveled up than me. So that's part of why I really had fun making friends with girls who were like even more into fitness and stuff because they could teach me things. And then I was giving them like my hair secrets and stuff, my hair care secrets. Um, if you want to know more about like beauty secrets, you can join the members page or the Patreon. But like with one of my friends, I was telling her about my curl secrets, like how I train my hair. Yes, you can train your hair. No, you don't have to use heat. No, it doesn't have to be heat damage. But anyway, that is something that I like. And I consider that to be a form of seduction. It's a form of attracting people who resonate with you or attracting people who can relate to you. So this can be used in friendships. I've, I've also seen people use this in family relationships. So for example, I didn't feel like I really resonated a lot with my first cousins because they just had a different lifestyle than me. But there was one second cousin that I had and I really related to her a lot. And her personality was like attractive and compatible with mine to the point where I was like, oh yeah, I wanna hang out with this cousin more because she is kind of like, more uplifting and she really helps me to feel positive feelings after I'm done hanging out with her and stuff. So I still do consider that to be a part of like seduction. I feel like seduction is more like you're finding people who are compatible with you, not just in a sexual sense, but in a friendship sense. It just means that you are enticing. It means that you are kind of like magnetic to that person. You know how people say, oh, I feel like we're soul sisters or I feel like I am your sister and I didn't even know you that long. Actually, people have said that about me on this YouTube channel where you feel like I'm your big sister, your little sister, your cousin, your daughter. And I feel like that is a form of seduction. It's kind of like magnetizing and attracting people into your life who can help you. And I feel like that's a part of increasing your visibility because I talked in another video about being the queen bee or attracting a friend group where like 
you made five new friends and then you got all of them to be friends with each other. And so you kind of created a friend group. I consider that to be a very, very small amount of popularity, which is like a small, tiny amount of fame. So that's important. If you want to have a friend group, because that's what I wanted. I wanted a friend group of girls who looked like me. They didn't have to be the same exact racial background, but at least women who were like kind of looking like me where we could relate to each other. And I was able to do that by attracting friends who had the same hobbies as me or like the same passions. Another way that I like to use controversy and attention to gain more fame and popularity is I like it when other people try to argue back and forth with me. So for example, on this YouTube channel, you guys know that I include mixed exoticals as well as black exoticals. And a lot of people, they don't like when mixed race black women and monoracial black women are able to come together because a lot of other niches on this uh, YouTube platform, they want to divide all of us up. But I like to use controversial terminologies or even make up my own language and make up my own words to describe my experiences. And that is one of the ways that you can actually draw more attention and visibility to yourself. Think about how people make up usernames on Instagram and on like YouTube and stuff. And they, they come up with these clever words or clever phrases to describe themselves or to describe kind of the vibe of their page. That is one of my main tactics that I use. And it really helps to draw attention to this channel because even if other people respond and argue back and forth with me, they are still recruiting subscribers to come over to my space. So that is another tactic that people have used in the past to gain more visibility and more fame. It's using that controversy. It's creating your own language to describe who you are, to describe your brand. Everybody should study branding. I don't care if you have a business or not. Your brand is basically what people say about you when you're not around. But if nobody's talking about you when you're not around, it's because you're not making noise. And so having haters is actually a sign that you are going down the right path because you're becoming more visible, you're social climbing, you are attracting more fame and popularity to yourself. So haters and gossipers or people who make up rumors about you to sabotage your reputation, that is a part of the game. And as far as using dark femininity to attract fame and visibility, I like to make myself as magnetic as possible. And the way that I do that is by always clarifying why I want to have that visibility. So one question you may want to ask yourself right now is, why do you want that fame? Why do you want people to know about the books that you write? Why do you want people in your neighborhood to know who you are? Why do you want to be the popular girl on campus? What is the purpose? Are you trying to help people? Are you trying to break stereotypes? Because I know that like for me, I'm just using this YouTube channel as an example. My goal is to break stereotypes. My goal is to call out hypocrisy that I see. My goal is to say the things that have been left unsaid and to use that to my advantage to attain things like wealth and notoriety. And I also want to turn the tide here on YouTube. I want to bring another point to the conversation. Um, I want to utilize the, the holes I want to utilize the loopholes that I have found in Black Empowerment Talking Points to magnify this channel and to make it more magnetic. So how can you find loopholes in your life? How can you find loopholes that can help you to get ahead? Is it via your pretty privilege? Does that make you more visible? Um, maybe you're good at social media marketing. Maybe you're really good at doing hashtags and gaining followers, or maybe you're good at like graphic design and visuals. You know how to make your stuff look really pretty. You have an Etsy shop or something like that. Why do you want those things? Because getting clear about your why, that is really going to help you to stay focused. And it's also going to help motivate you to keep going because Sometimes when it comes to attracting more visibility and fame, it can be a long road and you're going to have bumps along the way. Sometimes you might be more relevant. Other times your relevance may decline. But as long as you remember why you're doing what you're doing, that's going to help you to stay motivated. 
Another aspect of dark femininity is power, making power moves. Um, I sometimes like to say making money moves behind the scenes because a lot of people think that in order to have a sense of power, you have to be the most famous person ever. You have to be the most visible person ever. And that's not true. Even if I were to think about this YouTube channel, I went full time on YouTube at only 6,000 subscribers. I only have like 18K subscribers, yet my channel is growing faster than a lot of other channels that have been online for years. And so it's not always about having the biggest numbers. Sometimes it's about making power moves. It's about having more of a powerful impact on your audience. And that's what really gives you that community of stands. And another thing that you can do to manifest things like fame, popularity, and visibility is you can give your audience a nickname. So let's say you own a store or something, um, and you want to give your brand a nickname. Let's say you have an Instagram or a YouTube or something like that. You can give your subscribers or your fans or your customers a nickname, or you can have like a special greeting, a special intro or outro. Maybe you want to be popular in your family. You want to be known as the girl who throws the best parties. So maybe you can have some sort of theme that like really draws people in. You have really great decorations and you, you have custom designs. You have something special about when you do it. And it's something that other people can't replicate. But one of the ways that I like to become more powerful is to move in silence. So when it comes to getting brand deals, getting business deals, applying for promotions or applying for grants or something like that, I like to move in silence. I don't like to tell everybody every step of the way because if nobody knows what you're doing, then no one can sabotage it. So I like to um, have certain things that I keep to myself. I know when to keep secrets and when to reveal things to certain people. Because one thing I've learned is that some people have that mindset of keeping your friends close and your enemies closer. And so some people are literally just watching everything you do because they, they want to be you. They want to look just like you or act like you or they want to have the same success that you have. And so one of the ways that I always maintain my position of power is by moving in silence behind the scenes, especially if it's something important and I don't really want anyone to mess it up. And by the way, the concept of using dark femininity to attract fame and popularity and visibility, um, this applies to your everyday life as well. So let's say you want to attract a certain type of guy or something, or you want to be in certain social circles. The way that you can use dark femininity to do that is by once again, embracing that seductive energy, not being afraid of glowing up, not being afraid to take a risk when it comes to to your looks and your beauty. So let's say you have naturally long legs. Can you wear some high heels to make your legs look even longer? That's what I mean when I say you're, you're being magnetic, you're being seductive, you're standing out because you're taking a feature that you already have naturally and then you're emphasizing it even more. Another thing I've noticed that holds people back from attracting fame and visibility is they are afraid of the spotlight. They're afraid of people critiquing them. They're afraid of people disagreeing with them. And so one major mistake that a lot of people make is they spend their time criticizing other people. They spend their time focusing on other competitors and stuff like that. And they don't realize that they're actually increasing that competitor's fame by doing that. So like YouTube channels that spend their time focusing on my channel, they don't realize they're actually making me more famous because now I've got more people thinking about me. I've got more people curious about me. And here I am, I focus most of my content on talking points that I've curated over time. So people are coming here not to hear me talk about somebody else, but they're coming here because they actually like what I have to say. So I have the spotlight. That's another strategy you can use when it comes to dark femininity is always soak up the spotlight. Don't be afraid of the spotlight, but also allow other people to criticize you, allow them to continue talking shit because they don't realize that by talking shit about you, they are still increasing your spotlight. Have you ever noticed how Let's say you're around a, a group of guys and girls, like in college or something, and then people are randomly talking shit about you, like jealous girls are randomly talking shit, but they don't realize that by them talking shit about you, they're drawing more and more attention to you. So now even more guys are looking at you. Even more people remember your name. Even more people want to hang out with you because you are the talk of the town. That's what I mean when I say using dark femininity to manifest fame, visibility, and popularity. But what do you ladies think? Where are you on your visibility journey?
Let me know what you think in the comment section and I'll talk to you next time. Stay pretty ladies.